catch up is we do have the sermons on our website. You can listen to them audibly. We also have uh, the video. It gets on there about midweek. Uh, and so you can do it either one of those two ways. We also have on Wednesday nights, this coming Wednesday, we will have question and answer time in our Wednesday night Bible study about today's sermon and the reading that you did last week in chapter 4. If you have any specific question you would like to have addressed, uh, email me your questions. My email is on the bulletin. It's Tim at newhopechurch.net. Email those questions to me by about 8 o'clock Tuesday morning, and we will prepare to address the most frequently asked questions on Wednesday night. We had a tough time fitting all the questions in last week. I got no questions last week, all right? They were really hard to prepare for after the first two weeks, inundated with questions. <coughs> Particularly for Fawn Boss, but in a day of the question. I love it. Uh, but we had a lot of questions the first two weeks. Last week, and I know things are kind of changing, but send those questions. It gives us some direction of how to address things. We have a group of about 50 to 60 that have been coming on Wednesday night. We have a lot of fun. We'd love for you to come and join us. A high powered Chicago attorney went to Texas on a dove hunt. He shot a dove and it fell on the other side of a fence that had a no trespassing sign. The attorney climbed the fence and went to get his dove. As he stooped down to pick up his dove, when he raised up, he was confronted by a rough old Texas farmer. The farmer asked him, what are you doing here? The attorney said, I'm dove hunting and I shot this dove, I've come to get it. The farmer said, you can't do that, this is private property. The attorney puffed up his chest and said, If you don't give me my dough, I'll sue you. <laughs> the wise old Texan said, Well, that's not how we do it down here. <laughs> well, how do you do it down here? asked the attorney. We have the Texas free kick rule. <laughs> Puzzled, the attorney said, What in the world is the Texas free kick rule? Well, the farmer explained, I kick you three times. Then you kick me three times. We keep doing it until one of us gives up. Smart attorney thought about it. He said, I'm younger. I'm bigger. I think I'm stronger. He said, okay, let's do the three kick rule. The rough Texan got off his tractor wearing big cowboy boots. Kind of like Julie had on up here. All right? Got her red cowboy boots on. They look good, by the way. And uh, he kicked him in the shins. Man, did it hurt the attorney. Then he kicked him in the stomach and doubled him up and he fell to the ground. The attorney was getting to his knees. The farmer then kicked him in the head. He really saw stars then. After a little bit of struggle, the attorney staggered to his feet and he squeaked out, Now it's my turn! The Texas farmer looked at him and said, Nah, I give up. You can have your dough. <laughs> Dumb like a farmer, right? There are times that maybe a good swift kick with a cowboy boot might move things along. But there are some problems that cannot be solved by a good swift kick. You see, the number one barrier between God and us is this thing that Adam and Eve introduced to us when they made the decision to step away from God's plan and purpose for their life and to go their own way. And Adam and Eve have passed on to all of their descendants what we call a sin nature. And cowboy boots won't help. A flood didn't even help. You remember after Adam and Eve blew it in such a short period of time that sin multiplied so quickly and God regretted ever having made it. And so he found Noah and he said, Noah, I want you to build this gigantic boat. I'm going to send a worldwide flood. I'm going to do it. God said, I'm going to do a mulligan. All right, we talked about that. John Longstaff and Joe and I went golfing at the tournament on Friday, and John and I bought four mulligans, because we know how we play. And that gives you a do-over four times. Just as the flood was ineffective in changing the sin nature of mankind, those four mulligans didn't help our score any. You see, when Noah got off the boat, he may have stepped into a world that was not filled with sinful people, but he walked off the boat with his own sin nature. And in just a matter of days, Noah blew it as well. The 
story, this story that we've been reading, continues with how God wants to bridge to eliminate the sin barrier between us. Today, the story is going to open with God's new nation in need of deliverance. God started creation with one man, Adam. He did a do-over with one man and his family, Noah. And then he said, I'm going to put in a long-term plan. It's not going to be a short-term answer. It's a long-term plan. I'm going to put a nation in place that through this nation and these people, the world can know there is a God. And God picks a man, an old man by the name of Abram, and he says, you're going to be the father of a great nation. He was old and had no children, and he's even older, before. he's almost 100 years old, before he fathers his son of promise. Out of that son of promise, Isaac comes a son by the name of Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. Now things are really beginning to speed up in this nation building business. But the 12th son at that time, his name is Joseph, and he's hated by his older brothers. They abandon him. They sell him off to a group of wandering nomads and tell their father he was killed by a wild animal. Joseph goes off to Egypt and he's sold there. And you know the story. We talked about it last week. If you didn't read, read it. But Joseph ends up there and he becomes second in charge. You see, the Egyptians look favorably on Joseph because they help him in time of a famine. Not only did Joseph save the nation of Egypt, but Joseph also was used to save his own family who came to Egypt in need for food. And that is how Joseph's family, 70 of them at the time, ended up in Egypt. And from 70 to where we start today, they multiplied so rapidly. One person says they multiplied like rabbits. <laughs> there were so many of them that now the new Joseph is now dead. The Pharaoh that had favor with Joseph, and Joseph had favor with the Pharaoh. They're both dead. This new Pharaoh is now becoming terrified of this rapidly growing nation who was outnumbering his own people. And so now they are enslaved. They're using the Hebrews to build their cities and their pyramids. They are in need of deliverance. Many of you, at one time or another in your life, have experienced oppression. You've had an oppressive boss who's demanding and demeaning. You've been in an oppressive relationship. They've smothered you. Maybe it's a load of debt that you've lived under. Or maybe it's just the fact that you're in a financial crisis because of a bad economy. It weighs you down and you feel the oppressive force on your life. Whatever's weighing you down, whatever's holding you down, whatever's oppressing you right now, that's a tough way to live. It's a tough feeling to go through every single day. And you ask, we ask, God, are you anywhere now? God, do you care? God, would you come free me? When we look at our story, and then we look at his story, we have to ask the question, what does God's story say about our story? Is God in the deliverance rescue business? I believe he is. We must discover the upper story purpose in our lower story problems. Remember last week we talked about that? We live in a lower story, but God has an upper story perspective, and we need to see those on parallel tracks. The upper story of God is God's big plan, the big vision for him to be with us. From the beginning of time of walking with Adam in the cool of the evening to today, God wants to walk with us. God wants to hang with you. And every story in this book, from the first chapter to the last chapter, contributes to the upper story perspective in some way. The upper story is God's will as it's being done on earth as it is in heaven. But there's also the lower story. That's our daily living. It's the stuff that you and I put up with every single day. Relationships, jobs, families, boyfriends, girlfriends, illness, tests, busy schedules, paying the bills, passing the mashed potatoes at a big family feed, and then, for the Roland family this week, a family pet diagnosed with parvo. My new bird dog, Ashley's first puppy. That's the bummer news. Good news is, a vet called yesterday and said, Buster and I took a vote, he wants to come home. He's fine. He's going to be just fine. He beat him. Shelly asked me if I was going to pray about this. Those of you who know me, you know I love my bird dogs. Okay? <laughs> uh, I'm not a callous animal hater. Forgive me, little you animal lovers who put your animals on 
on the same par as human beings. Okay. I, I don't. Okay? They don't have a spirit within them. They're not made in the image of God. Doesn't mean we don't love them and care for them. I cried when I had to put my other dog down. I even cried when my son buried the other cat that I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I determined about praying for Buster was it was not so much for Buster I determined to be, but it was for us. One, how do we relate to the family? Number two, how do we how do we deal with this veterinarian who was really very good? First time we met him, he'd been referred to us. Uh, was referred to by Dale Ellis, who I did his funeral at the end of last year. So this is a very good guy who took care of all my bird dogs. And so we didn't really like this guy. And, and, and then I told him I was pastor of New Hope. He said, yeah, I know that. It's on your shirt. <laughs> the guy was wearing a golf shirt that had it on there, right? And that, it dawned on him in the middle of the night, man. It's one thing to advertise. But what do you reveal by what you've advertised? Well, he walk away with the Roland family and the care of each other and how they respond to crises. It's small crisis compared to so many other oppressions, but, but when it's dealing with your heartstrings, they become tough. But that's lower level stuff. How do we get the two? No matter how small maybe lower level stuff is, how do we live in the purpose of heaven in the midst of lower store stuff? God hears the prayers of all his people. Psalm 70, verse 5 says, But as for me, I am poor and I am needy. Come quickly, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. Lord, don't delay. Don't delay. He told Abraham he's going to be a father. But it was 25 years before he did. Now, this nation, wow, 400 years of oppression. But God didn't delay. We follow the story through Joseph. Let's catch up a little bit. Number one, God's new nation now is in danger of annihilation in Egypt. Joseph had been successful under God's providence to lead Jacob's family, a group of about 70, to safety and to prosperity to Egypt. This was a time in which they would have been destroyed if they hadn't moved to Egypt. And Egypt welcomed them with open arms. They welcomed them as wonderful guests. They gave them land, the land of Goshen, to enjoy. This new group of Israelites prospers. Over the years, they changed. A new Pharaoh, unfamiliar with Joseph, fears this growing race. Rather than outright genocide, he places them under forced labor. He then puts them under more controls, intending to reduce their numbers. He says, I'm going to kill all the male children born to you. You see, the decade of oppression turns into centuries of oppression for the Israelites. God says, it's now time for me to step in. It's no longer tolerable the way the Egyptians are treating my chosen people. So God is going to reveal himself now in three ways in delivering his people. God is going to reveal his name, I am. God is going to reveal his power, ten plagues. God is going to reveal his plan, blood on the doorposts. Now there's something that God had predicted in a promise to Abraham, if you have your regular Bibles, it's found in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. If you don't have a regular Bible, just write this verse down and check this out for yourself. I want you to understand what is happening to Israel now, at the time of Moses, was predicted to Abraham hundreds of years before. This did not catch God by surprise. Here's what God said. Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own. They will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish that nation they serve as slaves, and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. Remember that prophecy because it's fulfilled in our lesson today. God will bring grace and blessing even in harsh years of our lives, even in difficult times, just as he did with the Hebrews as they multiplied and prospered even in their slavery. But at the point of the story where we are, the severity reaches an unbearable level. Pharaoh finally results to a calculated form of genocide. He destroys all the newborn sons born to Israel. That's his attempt to control the growth of the Israelites. In his providence, God said, I'll deliver the Hebrews. And he raises up Moses right under the nose of Pharaoh. Many of you know the story. Even if you've not been in church, Mike, you know the story of Moses, the baby in the bulrushes. This is a lower story problem with an upper story purpose, if there ever was one. Moses was born. His mama realizes he's a boy. 
They're going to kill him if I don't do something. She hides him in a basket in the Nile River in the midst of the weeds and, and puts her daughter as a lookout to keep an eye on her son. And one afternoon, the Pharaoh's own daughter comes down to bathe in the Nile. As she's bathing in the Nile, and she is childless, and she is wanting a baby, and as she is there bathing, she notices this basket looked rather strange there in the river. She goes over, she opens it up, and there is a baby. What woman wanting a baby doesn't look at this beautiful baby and say, this is a gift to me, and she wants to take him home. She's the daughter of Pharaoh. He said, kill all the baby boys. Her daughter, though, brings this baby in and says, Dad, look at the gift. The Nile, one of their gods. The gods have given me a gift. When you bring this baby into Pharaoh's home, now he has a different perspective. He says, okay, you can raise him. You can keep him as your own. Now, the daughter who's been looking after Moses runs to her mother and tells her mother what's going on. And she says, you go back to the daughter of Pharaoh and tell her, you know a woman who could nurse that boy for her and be his nanny. And so she goes and tells her, and she says, bring her here. So the mother of Moses gets to be the nanny to Moses while he grows up in luxury in Pharaoh's home. She tells him as he's grown that he's a Hebrew and not an Egyptian. He grows up after he finds out that he's a Hebrew and not Egyptian. Not long after that, he sees an Egyptian wealthy man abusing a Hebrew. And he kills the Egyptian. Maybe justifiable homicide. But needless to say, the stepson of Pharaoh now has a wanted poster out on his head. Moses flees to Midian. He flees to Midian where he meets Jethro. Not only man. Not Jeff, no friend, only Jethro is there. He marries a young woman by the name of Zipporah, it's Jethro's daughter, and they have a son. And just a small note, we're not going to dwell on this long, but two questions for you. Number one, how many of you know the name of Moses' son, and do we ever hear from him again? Just an interesting fact, kind of investigating, all right? He's there for 40 years as a shepherd. Remember, here is a guy found in the Nile River, raised in Pharaoh's castle, and now is a shepherd on the backside of the Midian Desert, working for his father's home. The Pharaoh now dies. Maybe the one poster has been forgotten. Moses is tending chief on the hillside, sheep on the hillside, and he has an encounter with God at that memorable place called the Burning Bush. Right. It's a burning bush moment that will change his life forever. For Moses receives a commission to be the deliverer of Israel out of captivity. And it terrifies Moses. He loved the idea of deliverance. But he's not thrilled with the idea that he's to be involved in the delivering. That he will be God's instrument. So he balks at the opportunity. He basically says, hey, God, are there any other job opportunities that fit my skill set? God heard his question, and he answered, no, and no was an answer, kids, and no was an answer, God said no, it's kind of like Lindsay, what did Lindsay do her first day in the ivory coast of Africa, she did wound care, is Lindsay a nurse, no, she's a computer geek, is she working in her skill set? No. But God wanted Lindsay in the Ivory Coast of Africa on this mission project, and she's doing things she's never done before. Despite the direct encounter with God and the great education that Moses had received at the prestigious Nile River Academy, Moses sounds more like a hesitant Rocky Balboa being asked to fight for the sixth time. I kind of always pictured Moses a little like Rocky, you know, on the south side of Philly. And, and I don't do a very good Philly imitation, but you know, I can see Rocky saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not a good speaker, God. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, I'm just a shepherd kind of guy, you know, like I'm 80. And, and, and what, 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 what does an 80-year-old know? And, and my manager, Aaron, yeah, he, he's 83. We're, we're no good. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and to poor my wife, she's got to stay and take care of the pet store. <laughs> Some of you remember it. All right. <laughs> Moses chosen by God, even at his age, 80. Abraham, chosen to become the father of a great nation, is nearly a hundred before it happens. The other end of the spectrum, Joseph sent to Egypt at 17 to be God's instrument to save a nation. He 
see, age doesn't matter if God wants you. And here's a promise to every one of you. God wants you. That is the big vision of the Bible. God wants to hang with you. There's an email circulated about getting older. It says that these days, with all of us aging, particularly us older baby boomers, maybe some of the popular music groups of our day should re-release some of their hits in a little different way. How many of you remember Hermits Hermits? Remember them? All right. Maybe they could release Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter. Maybe they could do it again for us, and it could be Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Walker. <laughs> or how about uh, ABBA? Okay, remember them? Maybe they could do a new tour. They did one called Dancing Queen. Maybe they could do a new one called Ditch Your Cream. <laughs> We can't leave the Beatles out for that generation. What if the Beatles could redo a, a song called I Get By With a Little Help from Friends? Yeah, maybe they could do it. I Get By With a Little Help from Depends. <laughs> that kind of thing is what I'm talking about. Right? But age is not a factor in who God uses. God reveals his name, and he says to Moses, I am that I am. You want to find page 46 in the story. Okay, page 46, right about in the middle of the page, all right, just below middle, one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph, all right. You see, Moses is the guy who now in the burning bush is standing before God, that's upper story stuff, and he's going to be asked by God to stand before Pharaoh in Egypt, that's lower story stuff. This 80-year-old Moses being sent to be the deliverer of people, and it's just like God to pick guys like Moses, isn't it? He loves the unwanted, the unloved, the unfamiliar, the unlikely, the uneducated, the rejected, the denied. Is there any of us here who don't qualify at some level, somewhere in there? God wants to do amazing works to us. He gets a kick out of them. And so God promises to go and be with Moses and Aaron in a unique kind of way. He reveals his name to them. And here on page 46, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you were to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Uh, not I am here. Tell them but I am has sent you. That's a great name. Moses saying, what's your name? I am. It means I exist. I dwell in eternal existence. It's not just a declaration that God is present, but it's a declaration that his presence will be there. I will be with you. I exist to guard you and to guide you in this journey. It's a powerful phrase. Do you remember what happens when Jesus is arrested in the garden the night of his betrayal? Maybe you know the story. Judas Iscariot was the betrayer. He knows that Jesus has gone to the garden to pray that night. And so he goes and he turns Jesus in. And so he comes with chief priests, and he comes with a legion, a, a whole troop of soldiers. And they come to the garden for one man. And as they get there, you hear the soldiers ask Judas, where is the one? And Jesus steps out from amongst the trees of the garden and says, who are you looking for? And he said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And listen to Jesus' response in the garden Hundreds of years after Moses, Jesus says, I am. Jesus doesn't say, I am here. Who you're looking for? Jesus. I am. It's the name of God. For every Jew that understood the Old Testament, they knew that Jesus was saying, I am God. I'm present. I'm eternally existent. And I'm here. And you know what happened? The entire group of soldiers fell to the ground. You talk about power in a name. One man, two words, in front of a legion of soldiers, and the only one left standing is Jesus himself. God has power in his name, and it's that name that accompanies Moses and Aaron. God makes them a promise. He said, I will be with you. Page 48 of the story, midway down the page, fourth or fifth paragraph, is Exodus chapter 6. And God says, therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. 
I will take you as my own people. I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swear with you with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession, for I am the Lord. I will remove you from under the yoke. Remember the words of Jesus hundreds and hundreds of years later coming to me? All of you who are weary, burdened down, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. That's his promise to anyone who submits to him. Now, let's put ourselves in Moses' sandals for just a moment. You're being asked to go back to where you're wanted, and I don't mean wanted in a good way. You're asking your age to go back where you're wanted, with your history and your past following you. 430 years of oppression and slavery, and Moses is asked to deliver an angry, oppressed people out of the hands of the most powerful king that the world had ever known at that time. Here is a trust test. The heart of Moses is being tested because you see a bigger plot is taking place, an upper story plot. This is a trailer for a movie that will unfold later in our story. God's guiding, powerful hand is working in people's willing hearts. God is looking now, just as he looked then, for a heart that's willing to trust him. The Bible says God's eyes look to and fro all around the world, looking for a heart that's fully devoted to him. It's still the plot today. God at work by his powerful hand looking for your heart and mind, his big vision is to be with us. Now God not only reveals through his name, but God reveals in the ten plagues against the God of Egypt. And so Moses and Aaron agree. Rocky and Polly up for another fight. And they go back. And the stage is set for this great face-off that the world has ever seen. The hand and power of God against the heart and leadership of Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt. Now the Bible says a couple of things about this encounter. It says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Which is... <coughs> you both were right. Because it's both. Because Pharaoh had a hard heart towards God, and he made independent decisions, that that every step, God even hardened it more. Every step you take away from God, he hardened it more for Pharaoh. All right? And so, to try to get through that hard heart, He's going to send ten plagues. Ten plagues. Why ten? Mm -hmm. I don't really know. I'm going to suggest to you I know why nine of them. Because the one God of Moses is going to take on the nine gods that the Egyptians prize the most. Let's look at it. All right, we're going to throw it up on the big screen just for a moment. I think, all right, all right here we go. Ten plagues. And you'll find the first nine plagues in groups of three. And then the last one, all right? The, the, the very final one is there at, at the bottom. Ten plagues against the Egyptians on behalf of Israel. Each plague represents something. When you look at these plagues, have you ever wondered why gnats and blood? God knows exactly what he's doing. Each of the plagues addresses one of the gods or goddesses of the Egyptians. Pharaoh's response is seen then over on the far right. They come in three groups of three, and I want you to notice these plagues take place over ten months. Not over ten days. I got to tell you, as a kid growing up, I thought they got a play today, all right? Day 10, <laughs> we were out there, and it was up there. Really, I did. And it made sense to me. But this is over ten months. That tells me so much more. First, there's the plague where the Nile is turned to blood. Isis and Happy are the two gods, okay, of the Nile. And so he attacks these first two. You see, they believe that the Nile is where the gift of life came from for all the Egyptians. God goes right after that to begin with, and Pharaoh ignores it. Then there's the frogs. The, the name of the god uh, is the goddess of birth is Hate, and, and it's a figurehead of a frog on top of that statue. Isn't that real attractive? Wouldn't you like to send a frog to your sweetheart for Valentine's Day? <laughs> Pharaoh says, I might release the Hebrews under certain conditions, and then he reneges. And then there's gnats. The dust of the desert gave up gnats. Set is the name of the god of the desert. And it's being confronted in this one. And Pharaoh refuses Moses' request. Then there are another three plagues. 
and this just moves up in intensity. Flies, livestock, and boils. This is some pretty serious plagues right here. These plagues don't affect the Israelites at all, only the Egyptians. Look at the different gods and goddesses and at Pharaoh's responses. He says, first of all, go sacrifice. Just get out of my hair, get out of my sight. He doesn't want to free them. He needs them to build the cities. Just kind of get out of my view for a while, and then he refuses to release them. Then there is the third set, more intense than the others, hail, locust, darkness. Hail, the sky goddess, her name was Nut. And she was very temperamental. Maybe a little nutty. <laughs> sometimes she could have great fury in the sky. Sometimes she could be quite dull, uh, uh, compliant, docile. Other gods and goddesses wondered about Nut. How could she be so complacent sometimes? And how could she be so aggravated other times? And her reply was, sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. Work with me, guys. You might get sleepy. But that was kind of her response. All right, locusts and darkness. The greatest god of the Egyptians was the sun god. And notice, I find this ironic. Notice what they named their sun god. Rain. Interesting. Sun ray. All right. To bring darkness over the land at midday was a terrifying thing. So you see the growth of the plagues from something distant and far away, from the people to things like boils to darkness over the land, all of it terrifying. Imagine a bright sunny day in summer, and then suddenly absolute black darkness where you can't see your hand in front of your face. The Egyptian people were terrified. But this is not the end. Pharaoh still doesn't give in. But what I want you to see is that even in these plagues, God's desire is to be gracious and not harsh. He strings this out over ten months. He gradually intensifies the plagues. It's like God saying to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, I'm going to give you another chance. Can you look back at times in your life where God was giving you a chance? Yeah. And you ignored it? You said, not now, not later, <laughs> some other time. God said, I'm extending grace even in my judgment. God could have just wiped them out immediately. He could have. But God wants to restore even other nations. Remember what God said? Hey, I will bless those who bless you. And God had blessed the Egyptians for a long time because of how they treated Joseph and his other descendants. But God also said, I will curse those who curse you. And the Egyptians have changed from blessing Israel to cursing them. So now God reveals his name, his power, and now his plan in the tenth plague, where the shedding of a lamb's blood is required. God judges the Egyptians by killing the firstborn. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, Israel, the nation of Israel, was called by God his firstborn. He says to Egypt, you know you are killing my firstborn. So in judgment, God brings death to Egypt's firstborn child. This is the hard side of God. This is the north face of God. We don't like this side of Him. We like the gracious, happy, joyful side of God, but there is a side that ultimately, at the end of testing, at the end of opportunity, at the end of graciousness, judgment comes. Sometimes that startles us. Sometimes we don't understand, but it's part of the holy character and nature of God. The Bible says it's part of who He is. But God protects his people as they want to find shelter under the blood of the Lamb. This is where the Passover meal for the nation of Israel comes from. It's this tenth plague. God told Moses to tell all the people of Israel, find the finest, the finest lamb that you have. Sacrifice it. Prepare a portion of it for a meal and take the blood from that lamb and put it on the side post and the top post of your door. And at midnight, when the death angel comes over the land and it sees the blood, it will pass over the home <coughs> where the blood is seen. You see, if an Israelite chose to not participate, then the firstborn of the Israelite home would be taken just as the Egyptians. We used to sing a song in church, I will pass, I will pass over you. And you and I come to understand this is the clue from the fourth chapter. And the evil one, death, sees the blood of God covering our sins. He knows we are forgiven. He knows that death does not win in our life. Amen. That's the reason the scripture says, though you die, yet shall you live. Well, God
God protects his people as they find shelter under the blood of the Lamb. Pharaoh finally sets them free. He tells them to take their possessions, get out of here. Remember that passage I told you that was quoted to Abraham hundreds of years before? They'll end up rich. They walk out of Egypt with all their possessions. That kind of takes Pharaoh off after he lets them go. He says, they're taking a lot of stuff out of here. So he decides, you know what? I'm going to send my army after them. Bring them back or wipe them out. I want my stuff. And of course, we know the story we did about two years ago. We did the Red Sea thing here. And we know that they lost and Israel won and they're on their way to Canaan. Let's do a few lessons and questions for wrap up. First question that comes to my mind is, does God still hear the cries of his people? Does he still deliver us from oppressive things today? I really think the real question we're probably asking is, God, what about me? We're not really asking about, is God helping somebody else when they're oppressed? We're wanting to know, will he help me? Will he deliver me? Does he still work in this way? I don't know why God allows us to go through some of the things that we do. I saw a short video this past week of a guy by the name of Alexander. Uh, you can write this down if you want to check it out. It's a six-minute YouTube video. Uh, it's called uh, Secret Believers, the Alexander video. This is about a guy in the 1980s in the Soviet Union who, because of his faith in Jesus Christ, is thrown into prison. He's not just thrown into any prison. He's taken up into the furthest part of Siberia. It's cold. It's freezing. He is thrown into a cell with an open window. No blanket. Just a wooden bed. That's it. Clothes on his back. They figure that in 24 hours of that weather, if somebody asks what happened to him, they'll say the prisoner broke the window. He froze to death. Somehow, word has gotten out that he'd been incarcerated, and there were folks praying literally all over the world for Alexander. <clears throat> that particular night, as he sat in the cell, absolutely freezing to death, he said, I could just feel my body temperature dropping. I knew I would not see morning. He said, not long after midnight, he said, I kind of dozed into a stupor. He said, all of a sudden, I was bright, and I was alert, and I thought somebody had touched me on the shoulder. And I looked up, and there was nobody in the room. But he said, all of a sudden, all the coldness in my body was gone. I was warm. I was tingly. I felt refreshed like I hadn't felt in months. And he said, when the guard and the doctor came the next morning, they were shocked to see that I was alive. Not only alive, but I was warmer than they were. He said, I heard the doctor whisper to the guard, you better let this man go because I don't know what's going on with him. <laughs> and he was set free the next day. And today, in what was known formerly as the Soviet Union, there are, there are now hundreds of neighborhood churches that have gotten started because Alexander went back after this oppression and shared with them the marvelous <coughs> grace of God during his time of oppression. Does God still do it? i got to tell you, I've never experienced that kind of oppression. I've never experienced that kind of difficult life. Maybe for us, a name that some of us would recognize is Nelson Mandela. He understood that kind of oppression. You know his story. 27 years in prison, drinking horrible water, interrogated, riding in a van eight hours a day, chained to four other prisoners with a bucket in the middle of the van. Each of them had to take turns to use it for personal reasons. <laughs> How personal can you do it with four other people? <coughs> change to you. This is what he said about the time of oppression under apartheid. He said, the policies created a deep and lasting wound of my country and my people. All of us will spend many years, if not generations, recovering from that profound hurt. But the decades of oppression and brutality had another unattended effect that it produced. Men of such extraordinary courage, wisdom, and generosity that the light may never be known again. Perhaps it requires this depth of oppression to create such heights of character. Yesterday morning, Joe Avila shared with a group of men about a new program being launched in prisons throughout the state of California called TUMI, T-U-M-I, Theological Urban Ministry Institute. A man in California, in Southern California, wrote a check this past month for $4.9 million dollars. I think that's a lot. Isn't it? <laughs> Wrote it to Prison Fellowship and said, I want you to put this to me ministry. It was started by World Impact. It's a three-year seminary-level course of study 
that inmates can do is when they graduate from it, they will have a seminary degree. Paul, who attends our church in our 8 o'clock service, finished two of the three years, is my understanding. And then the reason he didn't get to finish it, they released him. And so now he's finishing up at California Christian College. And listen to the quote of the guy who wrote the check because they experimented in two other prisons and they've seen the difference it's made upon those men who were released. And this guy, this businessman from Southern California said, I believe the next great leaders for the church are right now being trained behind prison walls. Men and women who are discovering the character of God in great seasons of oppression. Very powerful words. I look at this lesson today, this story, and I ask, is it possible that God cares more about forming our hearts than he does about freeing our hands? Is there something that takes place in a human heart through oppression followed by the experience of God's deliverance that an oppression-free environment simply alone doesn't often produce? If you don't remember anything but this next line, this is the best thing. God delivered the Hebrews out of Egypt and it only took a day. After the tenth plague, it was just a day gone. But it took much longer to get Egypt out of the Hebrews. You see, that's true, I think, of many of us. God often delivers us from our oppressive situations, but we still cling to those things in the past. They still reside in us. Josh Hamilton, you follow baseball at all. Okay, center fielder for the Texas Rangers, relapse in substance abuse. Been clean and free and sober for nearly two years now. How to relapse? Why? You see, it's tough to get the old stuff out of control in our hearts. God is not the genie or the wish maker. He's our God. He's our lover. He pursues us with great passion. He wants to be known, not just known about in our relationship. You see, knowledge about God leads to pride. But knowledge of God leads to humility. Knowledge about God leads us to want to control others, but knowing God leads us to abandon others to God's purposes. Knowledge about God defines who God is, but knowing God reveals God personally. Knowledge about God may correct us, but knowing God surrenders us. Knowledge about God, we judge others, but knowing God restores us. Maybe God will do anything it takes to draw us to himself, even if that's to allow us to go through the wilderness for oppression. God wants our hearts. What Israel needed was not simply relocation. They needed renovation. And then they're hardly free. They're loaded with gold and silver they've taken from their oppressors. And you know what they do within the first week on their way to their new land? You know what they start doing? You read the chapter, right? What word showed up time and time and time again? Grumbling, grumbling, grumbling. Mo, we'd rather stay back there and work 17 hour days. At least we had two square meals in a bed. What do we got out of here? Sounds like kids on vacation with their parents. <laughs> Are we there yet? Don't touch me! Remember, every one of your kids who said that? Remember that? Remember, you were one of those kids once. <laughs> you were one. That's right. <laughs> For the Israelites, it was like, help us, save us, where's our water? All right? How soon they forget the gift and the grace of God, and how soon we forget them as well. Here's another question. Uh, what are we redeemed for? What are, what are you and I delivered from oppression for? What's the upper purpose and the lower problems? Did God free us from something? I would say yes. Did God free us to something? I would say yes. Did God free us for something? I would say yes. And how many of us live only in the first third of that? Just from, rather than to or for. Are we not free to love? Are we not free to serve? Are we not free to pray? Are we not free to give? Not only to be delivered, but to be used by God to deliver others so they can be free. I love where our church has been headed the last few years. I love celebrating three years with Celebrate Recovery. 
Our, I love our extension to the poor and to the needy, our participation in the lives of those who are going through hospice care. I love helping out to those who just had babies. Because once we've been delivered, we're called to be deliverers. Moses was taken from a basket and delivered to be a deliverer of Egypt. Mandela was taken from a prison cell as one who was oppressed and delivered, but then he became a deliverer. He could have been an oppressor, but Mandela chose to speak words of peace and deliver. Jesus, whom Herod tried to kill as a baby, was delivered, and he became our deliverer. What are we free for? To serve and to love. And are we, at New Hope, willing to be that kind of church and that kind of people? What would we say to that question? Yes. Yes. Kind of weak, but okay. <laughs> we didn't say no. That ought to be our passion. It's been said that in Jerusalem, Christianity was a lifestyle. In Rome, it became an institution. In Europe, it became the culture. And in America, it's become an enterprise. We've lost the soul of what it means to be a community of people doing God's purposes, carrying out the activity of deliverance. The church at large has lost that. But there are churches rising up, ready to redeem, recapture, and reclaim God's vision for the church. Sometimes God takes us on a long journey in the process. Sometimes it's through addiction and oppression. Sometimes it's a job situation or a family difficulty. But God will not waste the journey that we go on. i got to wrap this up. Let me get personal for a moment. Some of you were here today, and I know you need deliverance. Here's a couple of emails that have been sent to pastors just in the last three months. I'm tired of being sad all the time going every night crying about being alone, dreaming of someone who one day will kiss me goodnight. I'm tired of being unwanted, unloved, and undesired. Lord, I need you to be enough for me. I'm not ready to believe in more than just you. You're enough. Another one writes, for Wednesday and the Wednesday before that and all the days before that, bring me home from the last 11 years from the food, the lack of it, too much of it. I'm so, so sorry for using food as an excuse, to use exercise as an excuse. Bring me back, God, to normality. One more. Lord, thank you so much for loving me and blessing me. Thank you for touching me. I'm so, so sorry for messing with porn lately. I'm so, so sorry. I don't spend time with you. I don't trust you to lead me. I don't want to lose your love for me. I'm sorry. Porn. You ready for this? 62% of those who go by the name of Christians say they dabble in porn every single day. These are the cries of real people in oppression. For some of you, they may reflect your cry. You want deliverance from sin, addiction, internal pain, suffering. You need deliverance. Why don't we start with a prayer right now? If you find yourself in a predicament and you want Jesus to come into your life and help you be delivered from this oppression, would you join me in a prayer? Let's bow our hands. Dear Father, you know the personal cry of heart of every man and woman sitting in this room. You know what the cry of their heart was as we talked about Israel and Egypt. They were thinking about themselves and the food addiction, the alcohol addiction, the drug addiction, the porn addiction. You know that they were thinking about the oppressive relationship that has beaten them and bruised them. You know about their past that continues to haunt them. And they're ready for a fresh start and a new beginning. I pray that they will cry out to the God who says, I am. Not just the fact that you eternally exist, but you are prepared to be in your presence. May they say yes to you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And folks, and then they celebrate recovery. Give with a group of people who are walking the same pain, the same struggle that you have. Helps, excuse me, hurts, habits, and hangups. They got help for your hurts, habits, and hangups. You're going through financial crisis? Hey, that's why we have crowd ministry and financial peace around here. Walk with others who've been where you are. 
Let them be stone on stone, changing your life. Our long walk has not ended. We have a journey to walk together as New Hope Community Church. By God's gracious power and presence, He wants to extend His kingdom work. He's calling us to be kingdom people, and He wants us to join Him. And there's one last challenge I have for you. Many of you are sitting here in the pew, and you've already been delivered from whatever your oppressive background is, whatever your circumstances are. Here's the question for you. Are you ready to be a deliverer? Are you ready to let God use you whether it's with one other person, with one other family, with your block, with your employees, inside the context of ministry and church, are you ready to let God use you to be a deliverer? I'm too old. Not many of you are 80. A few of you. Doesn't make a difference. None of you are 100. And God still gave a nation. Not too old. Not too dumb, you're not too smart. You're just right. You're just right. Let's pray a prayer of surrender. Dear Lord, I'm yours. I'm yours without reservation. I'm yours without my dictates. I am yours for your leadership. I want you to provide for me a vision of where you want to use me in your kingdom's work. I don't need to do my work on the church grounds. I'm willing to let you use me where I live, where I work, where I socialize. Use me as your deliverer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Guys, have a great day. Watch after next week. Bye. Bye.